Hello, everyone. My name is Lane Little. I'm the director of the Polly Friedman Art Gallery at Ms. Recordia University in Northeast Pennsylvania. That's Dallas, Pennsylvania, not Dallas, Texas. Today, we have with us Jennifer Prince, who is one of eight artists for the Compulsive Measure show that we have on campus until October the 18th. Um, we, this is a series of nine chats uh, that we're having with both individual artists and as a group. And our group roundtable is this Thursday at six o'clock on EST on Zoom. And please go to our Eventbrite page for the invitation or um, go to our website. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. So I'd like to introduce our first artist, Jennifer Prince. Jennifer works in the media of photography and of drawing and her works, initial creation composed of noun upon a shifting palette are the works that you see behind me now from 2018 in their graphite and Epson inks uh, mounted on panel. So I will let um, Jennifer tell you a little bit more about how these works were created and then we can, um, we can have some conversation about it. Please use either the chat or the Q&A buttons at the bottom to, um, to join our conversation. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Lane. I'm excited to be here today. And I feel we both look really f official with our headphones and microphones today. <laughs> Um, so it's interesting because um, my background is actually in drawing and printmaking, but I use photography and I think I've always hesitated to refer to myself as a photographer because very much with that idea of printmaking, I'm always layering or incorporating the photograph in some other ways in my work. So it's like when people ask me what type of artist I am, I still largely label myself as a drawer, um, even though there are other things that happen within my work. Um, and I think a lot of that, and I'll go ahead and, and um, share my screen here, actually has to do with the fact um, that I see both drawing and photography as different ways of um, looking at the world. Um, oops, and let me make sure I get the view here. Okay, is that better? That's the slideshow view. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so this is one of my recent pieces, but this is typically what my desk looks like on a given day. Um, and maybe that's part of my um, obsessive compulsive sort of nature um, is that it's usually pretty clean and neat. Um, and that sometimes once I get going, I like to see how much I can really use <laughs> those graphite pencils. Um, so you can kind of see that happening here. Um, so this work, and, and these again are the pieces that are in the show that are behind you now on the wall, um, actually are an extension of a body of work um, that started in 2014. I had moved to Virginia a few years before, um, and I do live in Miami now. And before that, I lived in Los Angeles. I just, I guess I can't stay still very long. Um, and the thing with moving to Virginia that really just amazed me was the difference in the quality of the skies um, in Virginia versus Los Angeles is both that kind of lack of the air pollution um, that happens some in California and just the different atmospheric qualities. I was living in Roanoke, which is part of the Blue Ridge, and it actually sets in a big bowl, which causes for these um, huge kind of cloud formations. So I just started doing what any good artist does, and I was first standing in awe of them. Then I started photographing them. Um, and I just built up this collection of photographs um, of these amazing cloud scenes around my neighborhood. I also lived on top of a hill, which made this really easy to do. Um, and ultimately, I went off to an artist residency um, for a month on the island of Malta. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I know I, I knew I needed to be productive. Um, that's also maybe another obsessive thing about me is I, I like to make sure I use my time wisely. Maybe that's also um, you know, part of being a college professor. So I set out on this, not really knowing what I was going to do, but I printed out some of these photographs that I had been kind of collecting on my inkjet printer at the size of five by seven and started to do a drawing a day, kind of playing around with this idea of what actually hold the clouds in the sky. And that's sort of been the kind of 
a lot of the kind of two points of my work that came together, combining drawing and photography um, and starting to combine questions about science with a slow meditative process. So you can kind of get the sense here in these prints that are only seven inches tall, um, that kind of really precise kind of crazy mark making um, that I was making. And as I was working through this kind of exploration of um, different answers, um, what might hold the clouds and skies, you know, different structures, that molecules of air, um, being on this tiny little island in the middle of the Mediterranean, I was the Mediterranean, I was thinking about the differences between air and water. Um, and in the drawing on the right, it's sort of my play with that. Well, what if the atmosphere was like water and we could swim through it? Um, my humor comes out in the piece on the left, that is me drawing the in invisible clouds that might hold up the visible clouds that I could see. Um, and this project began, began I, was, I was going to do a drawing a day, but as you can probably guess with how intricate some of these drawings got, many of them took much longer than one day uh, to complete. Um, and it's one of those things that I, I kind of talk about sometimes with students is like sometimes you start a project and there's just a hook to it that you feel like it can continue. Um, and this has really led me down that road of continuing my work in a lot of different ways. One, it's led me to do a lot of different research into the sciences and how the sciences kind of um, reflect information about our world. Um, and that's been both contemporary and historical. So this, these images here are from um, the um, Nuremberg Chronicle, which was printed in the 15th century, and it told the history of the world up to that point. Um, and when I first saw these images in a rare book room, I was completely blown away um, with the simplicity um, of this idea of this concentric circle showing how the world was maybe created, of course, according to a judo christian Christian kind of viewpoint, but it also felt like cellular division. Um, and that led me down a road to kind of exploring the circular format and that idea of kind of creation or the cleaving apart of the emptiness of the, the void. And again, this is the photograph on paper um, and working with a really meticulous graphite pencil um, and just building up and completely saturating that photograph away. Um, and something similar. And when we got started, Lane, you made a comment, um, or before that we started about my work, maybe being about architecture or looking up through a uh, window or sunroof and um, architecture has slowly sort of crept into my work in different ways. And definitely, I think in this piece, to me, it feels like two large monuments of some sort. Um, and that's been happening more and more recently. Um, so in this, this work, which is in um, 2015, there was a lot of play with texture and intricacy, drawing a lot with um, the mechanical pencils and rulers, which are some of my favorite things to draw with, um, and considering things such as, um, again, from the Genesis story, that idea of maybe the sky and the clouds being something that was woven together along that illusion or something that can be folded and manipulated, which is something that I've been thinking about more and more, but the manipulation in a different way, how we're polluting and contaminating the environment more and more. Um, and that's kind of shifted. And as you can see that sort of here in this work with really, instead of dealing with these intricate textures, the obsession has become in many cases, how dense and dark can I take the graphite in my work um, so that it is kind of that mimicking of how um, through pollution, um, we might be, you know, really clouding up or um, the skies. And especially, you know, this work is, a few years old, but I think of what's happening in California right now and the views of the skies with the fires um, out there even earlier this year um, in Australia. But this work also sometimes reflects on, to me, on physics and my readings in physics and how there's just, in 
the visible light that we can see is smo so small compared to what is out there. So that obstruction is also that kind of meditative reminder to me that as much as I think I know, as much as we as a human race think we know, there's still so much that we're literally left in the dark um, about. Um, I'm talking a lot, Lane. Any questions or comments? <laughs> Yeah, I, I did find one of my students' writings about okay. the work, and he had chosen Initial Creation, okay, which is the one with the um, the arch upside down arches coming down. So mm -hmm. he interpreted this as a kind of condensation that this was a, a dripping form. The, the class is called Symbols and Subjects, and so what they're looking for representations of bigger ideas. So one of the things that he was thinking about was condensation. And I think part of it, um, what he was sensitive to is the varying density that goes across the, that sort of landscape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you and, may respond to that if you like. Oh yeah, I, I would love to. I think that's a, um, a really intriguing um, viewpoint on this piece, um, especially as I think about, um, and it's interesting, it rained a lot this morning here in Miami and I'm sitting right in front of French doors looking outside and you can still see the rain that has kind of collected. Right. So there is sort of that quality of that, that idea of the condensation dripping down across a field, um, a dirty glass or window. Um, and definitely, which is that, again, that kind of intersection of um, knowing and not knowing cl clean and not clean um, pollution uh, and purity. Um, so I, I really like his kind of interpretation um, of this piece. And again, this is, it's, it, there is um, that kind of, I like the, the form and varying it in shape and size. Um, and I play with that a lot in my work. And I just realized we've got something in the chat. Okay. Um, but I feel like um, that kind of rhythm is important to the work. So it's really intriguing to me that the older I get, the more of a minimalist I become. Um, and the, in both my artwork and then in also in my life in general, that kind of letting go of the non-essentials um, and letting the work just kind of be quiet and meditative. Um, and that contrast of the clean areas and the dark areas um, that in a lot of my work, be it the white of the paper or the drawn on versus the non-drawn on, um, that gives it that kind of quiet space um, to reflect on. Most of my question, my students were very curious about the background of the artists. And do you want to talk a little bit about how you got into art and how you got into teaching? Sure. Um, you know, what's really interesting um, is, and I, if I, I don't know if I could, no, I can't, um, I can't do it right now. But um, one of the things I keep on my screensaver on my smartphone is uh, an image that I drew when I was in kindergarten, <laughs> um, where it's, it's a picture in crayon of myself at the easel with a pair of Mary Jane shoes on and I'm painting uh, a rainbow, which is kind of interesting. I think it ties into my work in a lot of ways. So I might be a little different than a lot of people in that I feel like at ever since I was a small child, um, obviously since kindergarten, the idea of making and being an artist has been a big part of my identity. Um, and I think that comes uh, for me from, I grew up in East Tennessee in the mountains um, with a very large extended family and um, all of my grandmothers and then all of my grandmother's great or her sisters, my great aunts were all teaching me different ways to make. Um, you know, I learned how to um, sew via sewing sheets of paper together when I was maybe just four or five. Um, they were letting me help them uh, bake bread, do all kinds of things, beads um, and that kind of way of learning about the world and experience through just always keeping my hands busy is a big part of who I am today. And I think if I wasn't a visual artist, I would be, you know, some sort of maker in some other way. Um, so I pursued that throughout school. 
through high school. And then when I went off to college, um, you know, like a lot of other students, I developed really great relationships with my faculty. Um, I went to East Tennessee State, which at the time was small enough that I really worked closely with my faculty. Uh, and I was really impressed by their ability to teach and be artists and go to conferences. Um, and so I made a very early on decision that that I wanted to teach. Um, and I so I went off to grad school and have been teaching a few more years now than I really want to admit. But I think it's a great thing because I really get to share um, the passion for art um, and what I do um, with students and encourage them. Um, and so it, it, beca it became a nice fit. And at this point, I've taught at a lot of different types of schools. Um, and my current job here in Miami um, is really exciting to me because um, as a university, we have an international focus. Um, and a lot of our, our students have a lot of diversity, uh, some as first um, generation Americans, some as um, transfers and across a lot of different populations. Um, so it's really fun to um, learn about how their culture creates art and how they are making art about that uh, in their practice. That's really, thank you for the promotion for small schools. <laughs> we always like to tout the benefits of. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how people respond to your work? I know you've shown in many places all over the world. That, um, how do people respond? <laughs> That's always a great question. And it's always kind of a, a hard question, right? Because as artists, we want people just to be blown away. Um, it, but it, it's really interesting. I think it depends a lot on the individual. And I think um, there are, are people who um, are more interested in contemplative practices and in, in meditation who immediately understand what my work is about because um, that kind of innate energy as I'm making the work for hours and hours, it, it comes through, I hope, in the work. Um, for other people, I think because of the use of the sky, um, that makes a really nice entry point and makes the work accessible. So even if they're not 100% sure about what's happening, that's a point where they can start to question and engage in the work um, in a different way. Um, and sometimes people are just really um, intrigued with why uh, I'm using the materials I do um, and the fact that um, you can do so much with graphite. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons I keep using graphite is that it's like that ubiquitous tool. You can go to Target or CVS and get a pack of graphite pencils. You know, we all know it. So I think it's the most powerful tool to do is kind of this transformational kind of work um, to, you know, to push it until it's like really black and mirror-like or make really soft gray passages. I'm just really um, interested in that. And also in how um, graphite is a carbon-based material. And as we know, all life on earth is carbon-based. So it's also a, another reason that I like using it. It kind of ties into that universality um, that I like to have in my work. Yeah, that's interesting what you said about the graphite because now, I, I don't teach studio. I only teach art history, and my students are from largely from science backgrounds, not very much art in their academic training at all. So when we look at your work, we I have them get really close to it because you can see the points at which your pencil stops because there's a little nub at the end. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking about this, especially now when it's so important for students to think about the difference between face-to-face -face and virtual lives and what are we gaining and losing from these interactions so one of the things that they looked at was that this cloud is a natural thing but the way the graphite is laid out which is all done by hand with this organic material it looks almost mechanical like a barcode mm -hmm. so they were responding to the and they that's the way they kind of treat all of the works in this show is where does science end and humanity begin Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting, and when I when I draw with the ruler and get that barcode like effect, you know, it's like that there's that precision, it's precise, but then there'll always be a point where there's a little, my pencil goes a little bit away from the ruler, you know, so one of the things I joke with 
with my students is to embrace wabi-sabi, you know, that, that Japanese idea of, you know, the imperfections are what prove to us that this is made by hand. So when I made, when I make that little blurb, you know, that, or whatever, that little mistake, I, I, at first I, I was, oh, I've got to erase it, but now I'm more like, no, that just shows that it was me creating this and not that I created uh, a mechanical situation to make these marks. Renny, do you have any, would you like to chat with us for a little bit? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I love the, um, the description, Jennifer, of how you describe the act of making, um, you know, using the imperfection to prove your humanity, if you will. Uh, I think that comes through in all of the work and it's a way of sort of unpacking what it means to be human in this mm -hmm. world. Um, sort of what you were saying your students were coming up with in terms of, you know, the technical, the, 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 um, the virtual versus, you know, the actual factual hand. Mm -hmm. So I think that's embedded in the entire exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, and really was one of the prompts for organizing it in the first place. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to, I wrote, took a lot of notes, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't quite formed my questions yet, but um, um, you talk about trying to give the viewer an access point, you know, mm -hmm. something that's, you know, fairly abstract, um, very, fairly personal. And, you know, I think um, the sky is a perfect metaphor, you know, for what you're talking about and, and, and does exactly what you are hoping it does as a sort of door, an entry point um, into the work mm -hmm. or the viewer. <clears throat> Uh, and it's it's always you know something too I think when I think of in terms of universality right it, it, it's it, there's folklore is a myth in every culture around the globe about the sky its creations God's living there and and then it's just that reality if it wasn't for that that ten mile swath of gaff is above our head we wouldn't be living on this planet so it kind of you know ties into all elements of the work really nicely. It does. And I also think it ties um, your whole discussion about, you know, maybe responsibility to this earth, you know, and, and bringing awareness to, you know, like you're saying, pollution or, you know, obstruction. That ties in with a lot of the other artists as well. And maybe we can talk more about that in, in the group chat, sure. uh, where, where the connection, you know, that I'm starting to see uh, happening. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, what is, um, what is current or next for you, Jennifer? Okay, well, let me, um, I'll share um, my screen again, and I can um, maybe share a little bit of the things that I've been doing um, since COVID-19 hit. hit. Oh, I'd love it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let me do that. Okay, and then let me. Okay. Oh, actually, that's all right. So since COVID-19, I had actually, um, I was planning on going to Paris for a residency in drawing um, late March of this year. So I would had actually geared up to be create and I was starting a series of work um, to take with me. And then um, when COVID hit, um, and it became very obvious very quickly I wasn't going. It just was a great opportunity to finish that uh, body of work. And this is the place where I really feel like architecture like came into my work very forefront, very strongly, which makes absolute sense. It's like as artists, we create from the place that we are physically and emotionally. And so, you know, being quarantined at home, dealing with not being able to travel or see my students. Um, this work has a lot of very hard kind of architectural elements that are sometimes like fields coming up, stopping us. Um, and in other cases, they become like, this one I think is to me very hopeful because it feels like, you know, that we have these two very strong um, 
wall structures, but then we have this opening to the sky when we can see that sunlight coming through. So I think, you know, this work really deals with that sense that I felt closed in <laughs> um, while um, sheltering in place. Uh, but then also that I was looking for the hope that this was not going um, to last forever. Um, and these are very similar to the works that are in the show. Um, they're the photographs and graphic drawing with mechanical pencils. In this case, the backer paper is an, taken out of antique ledger books and you can see here the page numbers. Um, and so the photograph has a softer quality just due to that the treatment of the paper. Um, so it feels more a little bit more like a painting in some cases. I also spent time during quarantine um, doing a lot of little collage drawings. Um, and these I refer to as my borrowed sky series. So I had a couple of print magazines and I went through and tore and cut out every sky image that I saw um, and started playing around just responding to that and how, um, you know, building off the forms that were innately there, just responding, um, working really intuitively um, and kind of from that point of just you know, playing around with um, the commodification that I felt like was happening with the sky and these magazines to sell me these great experiences for travel that I couldn't partake in um, during that time. And although I primarily work in graphite, I did take the opportunity to start working with colored pencils to kind of push myself um, a little bit. So these pieces are still the collage on antique paper, um, some graphite, but then layering the colored pencil in a very similar way as my use of the graphite here. Um, and interestingly, you can see that that's that kind of arch form that was in the piece that we talked about earlier is repeating here. So that sense of kind of dripping and drooping um, or things opening and closing happens a lot in this work. Um, and then the most recent series, and I, this one, maybe I should, um, really makes a lot of sense to me now um, in COVID-19. I was asked to be part of a ex international exhibition of artists um, working off the idea of the postcard. And um, I had been doing some research and I've always been really fascinated with the Victorian time period for a lot of different reasons, um, but their public display of mourning. So as most people know, during the Victorian time period, we've seen it in movies or read it in novels, that if you lost a family member, you would wear black clothing for uh, a certain amount of time, then you could wear gray or a black armband, um, ways that you would, that people could just visually tell you were in a period of mourning. But also during that time period, people would actually, if they were writing correspondence, they had special mourning stationery. And that morning stationery um, actually had a black edge that was printed or drawn on it. So if you got a letter from someone, you knew that they were in mourning. So I was asked to do this work about postcards, and I'd been researching um, and looking at different examples of Victorian morning stationery. So I combined the two together um, into this project where I actually took these, and these um, drawings are the size of a standard postcard. So they're uh, eight and a half or five and a half by eight. Um, and I looked at examples of vintage postcards and the area where you would typically have the image of the Grand Canyon or uh, Buckingham Palace or wherever you were traveling to printed on the postcard, um, I filled that in with the black graphite. So it sort of becomes, the, to me, this meditation on all of the losses and the grieving um, that so many of us have had during 2020 due to COVID-19, that there's that mourning for the places we didn't get to go, um, the people we didn't get to see, or things we didn't get to experience. Um, and so this project has been a great kind of outlet for me um, to um, deal with that energy 
And here you can get a sense of, of the scale and how many pencils I killed uh, in this project. That's a great project. Um, I think we're all trying to, I think the studio has been a, you know, a wonderful place to sort of distract and us from really what's going on around us. And, and I've done a lot of collage pieces too. I wonder if that's just because we're kind of using whatever that <laughs> Absolutely. I think, you know, that's, you know, having a studio practice um, and then just making use of whatever is available has really allowed a lot of us to thrive or at least continue um, in the past, you know, six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to try that with my students to see if uh, they'll respond to that because I really, um, with the postcard series, I felt that so keenly because sometimes I do feel like I'm walking in a fog or sleepwalking and that sort of dimming out of aspirations and plans is very very much hits home for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well on that <laughs> happy note um, I think we're going to um, to end this conversation here unless you have some other things that you'd like to to share with our audience so Okay, thanks to everyone who has joined us, both in the live and the recorded version. Join us again at one o'clock today for Tanya Softick, and then um, Wednesday we'll go again at 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., and then Thursday at uh, 6 p.m. And we have a whole slew, so please check our website and check our Instagram and Facebook pages for more on these. There's also a catalog of the entire series of on blurb.com, and we'll post that link on our website as well. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Rennie, um, for both contributing to this conversation. It was great to meet you and talk to you. And thanks for all your insights and your response to our students' work. Great. Thank you so much, Elaine. Thank yeah, you. it was really great. I'll see you this afternoon. Okay, see ya. <laughs>